hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four parts. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to part one. You will hear a telephone conversation between Jason and Laurel. They are arranging to meet later to go to an art gallery. First, you have some time to look at questions one to seven. Hi Laurel, it's Jason. How are you? Jason, so glad you called. I'm fine. You must have got my message on your answer phone. I wanted to know if you were free tomorrow to go to the opening of a Gaudi exhibition. Yes, I heard about it and thought of you straight away. So you're free tomorrow? Yes. Um, what time do you want to go? Well, I have a class at college in the morning until 11.15. Wait, no, 11.30. So any time after then? I have a lecture until about 12.15. Um, well, that works perfectly. Do you want me to come pick you up? No, you're much closer to the gallery than I am. Which gallery is it? The Tate, which is really good because I can get there pretty easily by tube. Oh, right. OK. Um, where do you want to meet and at what time? If I leave when I finish my class, I can probably make the 11.55 tube. That should get me into central London in about 25 minutes. I can come to the Tube to meet you by 12.30. It's probably easier to meet at the Tate. The Tube is pretty quiet at that time, not the usual rush of people, so I should be OK. And they've installed a new device in the lift for wheelchairs so I can get to the street without having to wait for long. Do you remember the old lift? Yes, it was horrible. It made that loud clanking noise, ugh, and the smell would make anyone pass out. The new lift is quicker and the wheels of the chair lock into a safety system that allows you and whoever else is in there with you more room. It's a lot quicker. That's a relief. OK, so where are we meeting? How about at the ticket office at the Tate? If I get there first, do you want me to buy you a ticket? No, I get a concession and need to show my card. Ooh, lucky you. How much do you pay? About £10 for major exhibitions on Tuesdays. Well, that's pretty good. The normal price is another five. Hang on. Did you say Tuesdays? Yes. Tomorrow's Tuesday. Yes, yes, you're right. <laughs> Why did I think it was Wednesday? Oh, because our lecture times have all changed this week and it's put me off. OK, hang on. I have no class, so I can come and pick you up. Can your car take my wheelchair? Yes, I've got the van, so there's plenty of room in the back. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 8 to 10. What's your address? It's flat 6, 83 Alexandra Avenue, West Hampstead. Let me write this down. Flat 6... Yes, that's 83 Alexandra Avenue. Alexandra Avenue? Yes, West Hampstead. Got it. OK, I'll be there at 12.30. Um, will you be home by then? Sure will. Thanks, Jason. See you tomorrow. OK, bye. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one.
Part Two. You will hear a tour guide talking about the New Grange Passage Tomb in Ireland. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to sixteen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to sixteen. Good morning, and welcome to the Bruna Boyne Visitor Centre. Newgrange is one of the finest examples, not only in Ireland but in Western Europe, of the type of structure known as a passage tomb. It was probably built about three thousand BC. That makes it around five hundred years older than the pyramids in Giza in Egypt, and a thousand years older than Stonehenge in England. Before we start our tour, let me tell you a little bit about what you'll be seeing. New Grange consists of a long, narrow passage and chamber, which, if we imagine looking down on it from above, would have the shape of a cross. In the two rooms of the chamber forming the arms of the cross, you will see large stone basins, which are a feature of many Paleolithic Irish tombs, though researchers can only guess about what their purpose would have been. Outside of the tomb, in front of the entrance to the passage, sits the large carved entrance stone, which I'm sure you've all seen pictures of in magazines or textbooks. After all, this stone is about the most famous example in the entire repertory of Paleolithic rock art. The spirals and zigzag lines covering it are strikingly beautiful. Some of the large curb stones lining the inside of the passage are also decorated, although they're not as famous. An eleven-meter-high circular mound made of stone covers the tomb, making it appear even larger and more imposing than it is, especially from a distance. The final thing I want to mention before we set off is the light box, which is an opening that you will see in the roof of the passage above the entrance, which allows the light of the sun to enter and illuminate the tomb at sunrise on the day of the winter solstice. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions seventeen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions seventeen to twenty. Actually, I want to tell you a bit more about the winter solstice at Newgrange. The alignment of the tomb to the winter solstice sunrise is, without a doubt, one of the most amazing features of Newgrange, and has led researchers to speculate that the site may not have been only a place of burial, but may have had broader cultural importance as a place of spiritual or scientific significance. Indeed, to witness the winter solstice sunrise illuminate the tomb is breathtaking, and still has a deep resonance with people today. The general public are welcome to gather at Newgrange for the sunrise on the mornings around the solstice, but access to the chamber itself is limited on the solstice morning, and is decided in advance by the lottery. It's proved to be extremely popular. Last year, there were twenty-five thousand three hundred and forty-nine entries for the solstice lottery's fifty places. But don't despair. In recent years, the event has been transmitted live by the Office of Public Works to hundreds of thousands of people around the world via internet and television stations. This year's draw will take place on September 30th, and the winning applicants will be notified by mid-October. To assure that everything is fair and square, children from three local schools will choose the winning applicants. Fifty names will be drawn, and each of the lucky winners can bring a guest. But of course, one hundred people won't fit in the tomb. We have room for ten lottery winners and their guests in the chamber on each of the five mornings around the winter solstice. If you're interested in signing up, you can do so at the information desk on your way out. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers to part two.
Part 3 You will hear a dialogue between a doctor and a patient. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Hello, Dr. Smith. Can I come in? Yes, please. Sit down. I won't be a minute. Thank you. You would be Mr. Garrison? Yes, Peter Garrison. Okay. What seems to be the problem, Mr. Garrison? I've been having some pains in my stomach and it's been bothering me for nearly two weeks, actually. Ten days to be exact. What happened at the time the pain started? I was having dinner with my family and I thought I must have eaten something that didn't sit well in my stomach. Then what did you do? I drank a glass of Alka-Seltzer to ease the pain, but it didn't work. Do you remember what it was that you ate at the time the pain started? Yes. I was eating pumpkin soup with bread and then we had roast chicken potatoes, some vegetables, and afterwards dessert. I think it was chocolate pudding with cream. That's quite a lot of food. Yes, well, I do like to eat. Do you do any form of exercise? No, not really. I mean, sometimes I might go for a walk. How often? Oh, maybe once a month. And for how many hours? Oh, no, not a long walk. I might walk to the local shops instead of taking my car. How far away is the shop? About five minutes. By car? No, on foot. Well, I think the problem here is that you're quite overweight from the looks of things. You don't exercise and you eat far too much. So I'd say the issue you're having with your stomach is something that was inevitable. I'm going to suggest a few things, but you have to comply. Otherwise, there's no point in me going on. So... It's serious. It will be if you don't take steps to change your lifestyle. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now, listen and answer questions 25 to 30. Oh, what should I do? First of all, I'm going to give you a list of what you can and can't eat for the next month. I want you to follow this quite strictly. Do you understand? Um, yes. For breakfast, I want you to have a cup of hot water and lemon juice. Is that all? No, let me finish. Sorry. After 20 minutes, I want you to have a freshly squeezed juice of either fruit or vegetables. Then, eat either cereal without sugar and with low-fat milk, or, if you don't like cereal, then have some toast. You can use honey or jam that is organic only. But I don't want you to use any butter and no sugar or salt. For a whole month? Yes. Then, for a mid-morning snack, you can have two pieces of fruit. Lunch will be two pieces of brown organic bread with either avocado or hummus instead of butter and salad. Then in the afternoon, you can have a handful of nuts, but not too many. Okay so far? Well, it all sounds a bit hard. You know, it doesn't seem like much. For dinner, you are allowed a small quantity of about 100 grams of either brown rice or pasta with steamed or baked fish and vegetables. If you must have dessert, 
You can either have another piece of fruit or some low-fat organic yogurt. Where do I buy all this organic food? There's a shop in the high street, and I want you to walk there. It's just opposite the town hall. Okay. I want you to be a hundred percent dedicated to this diet. Is that it? Yes, and I'll see you in a month's time to reassess you. Okay, doctor. Well, I'll see you in a month. Oh, and absolutely no alcohol, coffee, or cigarettes. Oh dear. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers to part three. Listening, part four. You will hear part of a lecture on photography. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Last week we focused on the creative side of photography, composition, etc. But this week it's time to get a bit more technical. Today our focus is going to be on exposure. The term exposure simply refers to the amount of light your film is exposed to, or put another way, the amount of light you allow to strike your film. A good photographer has got to know two things. One, how much light is required to capture a particular image, and two, how to control the light reaching the film. The former is usually determined by the camera's inbuilt light meter, and the latter is taken care of by means of the aperture and shutter settings. Essentially, exposure time is controlled by opening the aperture and allowing light to pass through it for a fixed duration. Aperture sounds like a fancy word, but in simple terms. It is basically a hole whose size can be varied to allow more or less light to pass through it. Aperture size is described in f numbers, with each f number being half as bright as the previous one. The difference in value between one full f number and the next is known as a stop. The smaller f number, the larger the aperture, and the greater the amount of light being let pass through it. Shutter controls also play a crucial role in determining the exposure for a shot. The shutter prevents light from reaching the film until the instant of exposure when a picture is being taken. Then it opens for a predetermined amount of time, allowing light to pass through the aperture and onto the film. Shutter speed is expressed in seconds or fractions of a second. A one-unit change to the shutter speed is also known as a stop, and a change of one stop to the shutter speed. Has a similar outcome to a one-stop aperture size adjustment. Overexposure, as the name suggests, occurs when you give your film more exposure to light than is necessary to capture a clear image. Telltale signs of overexposure include pictures dominated by pale or light shades and poor washed-out colours. Underexposure then occurs when there is not enough light and produces the opposite result: a dark image with poor detail and shadows. Before we go on to look at how to ascertain the correct exposure settings for a particular shot, let's take a short break. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four.
That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.